debate is swirling around how police can cut back on lethal force. Some companies are promising a new solution, high-tech tools like remote handcuffs for police to reach for instead of their firearm. Of course, less lethal weapons already exist, and they've been used at protests across the country since the police killing of George Floyd on May 25th. Amnesty International tracked the use of force by law enforcement at protests from May 26th through June 5th. The total of 125 incidents of police violence, excessive use of force, in 40 states and the District of Columbia. And we saw misuse of tear gas, pepper spray, pepper balls, 40 millimeter impact rounds, basically every combination of less lethal weapon being used in inappropriate ways. Some examples. In Portland, federal agents used batons against medics and fired tear gas and projectiles into crowds earlier this week. In Indiana, a journalist lost an eye after police shot him in the face with a tear gas grenade. A 20-year-old protester in Texas was in critical condition after a beanbag round fired by officers cracked his skull. In Minneapolis, the National Guard shot impact projectiles into people standing on their front porches after yelling, light them up. Light them up! Go inside now! Get in the hell! In Philadelphia, police used pepper spray and tear gas to drive a crowd up a steep embankment with a high fence. There is no national standard for the police use of these less than lethal projectiles. And there's no comprehensive data that we could look at to help us understand how pervasive they are. Uh, that's challenging. A lot of the tools that we have are very, very effective. They work very, very well the vast majority of time. The outlier are those that are injured, unfortunately. Those are the exception to the rule. Now, some police are hoping to cut down on injuries and misuse with new types of less lethal devices. Policing started with, you know, capturing slaves, slave patrols. So this stuff has been handed down for a long, long time. So policing have evolved, but I don't know if the culture has. While some of the country's 18,000 plus law enforcement agencies are now implementing new de-escalation policies, and some federal judges have ordered temporary restrictions on less lethal force, the fact remains that these weapons are big business. The market for less lethal weapons is expected to reach $11.85 billion by 2023, and less lethal ammunition alone is expected to hit $1.21 billion by 2027. Every time I'm looking for a new weapon, I'm finding new manufacturers. It's my job to keep track of all of these tools and all of these weapons, and even I can't keep track of them all. This is a look at the new high-tech tools police are using for less lethal force, how they're regulated, and what's at stake for the future of policing and the communities they serve. High-tech devices designed for less lethal force have not always caught on. There was sticky foam, substances to make people slip, the taser shockwave, stun shields, and even net guns. It's a challenging industry to break into successfully, so many of the tools that do work have been around for decades. Police are often trained to follow a use of force continuum, starting with their voice on one end of the spectrum all the way up to firearms at the other extreme. Traditional tools like handcuffs and batons come after voice commands on the use of force continuum, then chemical agents like tear gas and pepper spray. One big tear gas manufacturer, Safariland, brings in close to half a billion dollars of revenue. But in June, Safariland announced it's selling off its crowd control division after mounting controversy over how tear gas has been used in recent protests. If you trap people in a building or against a building and you fire tear gas at them enough, um, so that way they're choking, you know, we would call that torture. Then there's less lethal munitions like rubber bullets and beanbag rounds, which can still be fatal. In 3% of the cases with less than lethal body protective projectiles, individuals died worldwide. And, and that's, you know, 15% of, of those folks studied were permanently injured. So these aren't harmless. They need to be as regulated as you would regulate guns. Finally, just before the firearm on the continuum, there's the taser. It's been involved in more than 1,000 deaths nearly all in the last 20 years. A taser's five-second discharge of 50,000 volts of electricity can lead to cardiac arrest, according to one 2012 study. Still, Axon, the company that makes taser, estimates that its device has a death rate less than one in 100,000, and that it's prevented death or serious bodily harm in more than 236,000 cases. To deploy the taser is good. I've seen it used 
numerous times and it worked in the situation and I'm right there on the scene. It has worked. So these things, you can use these non-lethal devices to be very successful. When protests turned violent days after George Floyd was killed, shares of Axon spiked more than 18 percent, reaching all-time highs. Ultimately, the use of all of these weapons should be a last resort. And so the development of newer and fancier weapons is maybe not where the money should be going. The money could be going towards community policing and social work and mental health skills. But some, like Georgia Representative Vernon Jones, have directly asked President Trump for more funding for police to purchase less lethal force tools. When you look at law enforcement and the equipment, that's important for them because it's protecting and save their lives as well as saving others' lives. But clearly more money is needed to buy less lethal uh, enforcement types of tools like the uh, bowler, what they call the bowler wrap. Right. The bowler wrap is a handheld device. It's about the size of your cell phone. There's simply a button that you press and it deploys out an eight foot Kevlar tether. Tom Smith co-founded Air Taser, now called Axon, with his brother in 1993 after two of their friends were fatally shot in a road rage incident. They wanted to develop an alternate method of self-defense. We can put man on the moon and we've had all these advances, but the way people defend themselves is still the way they fought the Revolutionary War, you know? So we wanted to take a technology approach to that. Now, Smith is the president of Rap Technologies, maker of the Bola Rap. He says it's far safer than a taser and even pepper spray on the use of force continuum. It uses two anchors with fish hooks on the end to attach itself and basically think of throwing handcuffs on somebody from a distance. Smith says it's so painless, he would feel comfortable using it to restrain his mother. It's no big deal. I've been wrapped six times in, in 20 minutes because, again, it's just wrapping the cable around you and attaching to you so it's not inflicting pain. It's coming out so quick, over 500 miles an hour. And by the time you hear the sound, the person's already wrapped, really. Nearly 150 police departments are already testing the bowler wrap, and some have successfully used it in the field to detain suspects. A gentleman that had a, a, a pipe and was threatening officers, and they were able to use this to wrap his legs and immediately stop him. One of the most difficult things in the world a police uh, person can attempt to do is handcuff someone that doesn't want to be handcuffed. Each handheld bola wrap device costs around $1,000, with one-time use cartridges that are $30. Police often use drug forfeiture money to pay for new tools like this. Spending more money on newer weapons technologies is not the panacea for the policing problem. Maybe this is less dangerous than rubber bullets, probably is, but do we need this? Is this the solution? All of these devices should be at hand, you know, for the cops to use other than deadly physical force being used by a firearm. Because it's the only profession in America where the citizens give you the right to take their life. I guarantee you there's gonna come a time in the next five years or so where the people are gonna be saying, how come you didn't wrap them? But like any tool, the bowler wrap can still be misused. If you're aiming and you hit someone's neck, it's because you aim there. And so you obviously have no business doing that. It's not a perfect world. Things could happen. Probably the biggest concern could be if someone's aim was completely off for some reason and the hook actually got in someone's eye. Another category of high-tech, less lethal devices is directed energy weapons. This includes the active denial system, like a system the military named the Silent Guardian. Essentially, it emits a microwave beam that heats the water in a person's skin to cause pain. I actually had it deployed on me and it, it's like microwaving your skin. It's, it's not a pleasant experience. It can also destroy certain electronics. You shoot it at a metal object, and the metal object gets very, very hot. For now, the large system has to be attached to a vehicle. It was deployed in Afghanistan in 2010, and the LA Sheriff's Department later announced it would test a smaller version for things like breaking up prisoner fights. The laser dazzler is another directed energy weapon. That's like a super bright light or a green laser that they'll point at you that tries to make you disoriented or dizzy. And then there's long-range acoustic devices, or LRADs. Often referred to as sound cannons, the LRAD was invented by the same person who designed the bola wrap. I got an idea to take the bola, which the gauchos used, and bring it into the 21st century. When he was looking at making this handheld bola wrap, he was trying to reduce that LRAD to a handheld size and he just couldn't get it small enough. They're a sound wave or a shock wave device that's designed to make it uh, too uncomfortable to be physically present in the location. So you feel pressure in your ears, you feel 
as if you've got to get out of there. And that, I think, is the intended effect. It's in use at a handful of police departments in states like Maryland, North and South Carolina, Arizona, and California, where the sheriff said it could assist in hunts for missing persons and tsunami warnings. Protesters have reported experiencing painful sound blasts from LRADs at recent gatherings, prompting engineers to develop shields against them, although they're commonly also used to make announcements that can be heard above crowd noise. A citywide curfew will be in effect. While rubber bullets and beanbag rounds are nothing new, other types of single slugs are also becoming more common. You also have new what are called pepper balls, which are paint balls, but instead filled with pepper spray or tear gas. I first saw the pepper balls in Benin in West Africa a couple years ago, but then all of a sudden, police departments all over the country are suddenly shooting pepper balls, you know, all at once at the end of May and early June. And there's a variety of other new materials being used for less lethal rounds. It's like a classic foam round. Like sponge, hard foam, and even chalk, which is traditionally used in military training to leave behind a mark. The idea is that the police are marking people who have maybe committed a crime for arrest later or to be targeted later. In the context of the recent protests, human rights organizations say any projectile is problematic. Weapons that are supposed to be for police to subdue an individual person are actually being used to disperse crowds. That's unlawful and an excessive use of force because any use of force against a peaceful protester who's not committing a crime would be excessive. There are also new types of water cannons being used by police. Some shoot colored dye to mark protesters. Say they go to the hospital for an injury and they're purple. Police can come in later and arrest those people and say, it's obvious that you were there, you've got purple dye. That not only violates basic rights of protest, but it also implies that you're, you, you have a fear of health seeking. Another type of ammo used in water cannons is called skunk. It's a non-toxic, foul-smelling liquid that's been purchased by police forces in Missouri and Louisiana, according to reports. It smells like raw waste, essentially, and can last days or weeks, and so it makes it difficult for shops to continue to function, for people to go back to real life. In Atlanta, the city council requested in July that police explore new types of less lethal devices for crowd control, specifically mentioning devices that operate like the skunk, bowler wrap, and laser dazzlers. Police are also using new types of high-tech grenades, including at least once during recent protests. They're called stinger ball grenades. It has got some amount of tear gas or pepper spray in it, a flash like a flashbang, a loud sound like a flashbang, but then it's also filled with rubber pellets, which fly in all directions and hit whoever happens to be there. Flashbangs are another type of grenade police have used at recent protests. Originally designed to disarm suspects in hostage situations, flashbangs have seriously injured, maimed, or killed at least 50 people since 2000, according to a ProPublica report. They have a very bright flash and a very loud noise, like extremely loud. And so if you are holding one of these things, when it goes off, it will take off your hand. Despite the recent use of flashbangs and the firing of rubber bullets at protests, a 1989 Supreme Court case set precedent that it's unconstitutional to use force against everyone in a crowd. You cannot indiscriminately use force against everybody in the area. You can only use it on the people who are causing the problems. If you're wearing the badge and you're carrying the gun, it's your job to differentiate between the people who are creating mayhem and, and violating the law and people who are doing something that's constitutionally protected. Internationally, the United Nations passed the 2020 Guidance on Less Lethal Weapons and has a widely accepted set of basic principles on use of force and firearms meant to lessen injury to bystanders. I handled a series of cases arising from the unrest in Cincinnati in 2001 in which uh, beanbag rounds were aimed indiscriminately at the crowd and the victims included little children who were crossing the street to get ice cream with their mothers, elderly people, uh, a, a school teacher who lost her spleen. Despite the Supreme Court ruling, there is no national legislation around use of force. The 18,000 plus U.S. law enforcement agencies each set their own policies. It's the Wild West out there because there's no regulation. But this may be changing. In California last year, Governor Newsom signed the first statewide general use of force order, specifying deadly force may be used only when necessary in defense of human life and encouraging more use of de-escalation techniques. At a certain point, you have to ask yourself, even if this is okay constitutionally, is this really how we want our police to be providing police services? 
and the legislature determined that they wanted a, a bit more control. Most agencies do require investigation into every use of force. Tasers, for example, send out data every time they're fired. But regulation of the new tools coming out remains lax. Interestingly, they're all privately held companies that don't have to report to shareholders and largely don't report what is in their products, uh, the safety considerations of their products, the potency. And if they had to publicly report, um, then I think that there would be a lot more standardization and probably a lot more safety protocols. For police on the ground at protests and beyond, perhaps the most important thing to consider when adopting new, less lethal devices is the training on how to use it properly. So if they have a menu of different weapons to use, you can't possibly remember that one weapon is supposed to be fired from 85 feet and the other one from 120 feet. This one's supposed to go at the feet. These are supposed to go at the chest. No matter what technology you use, if the individual using that technology is abusive, then it's going to have an abusive output. The reality is it doesn't matter what you give officers. If they're not trained how to use it appropriately, then you're going to have problems. The emphasis really needs to be focused on not taking away the tools, but the how, where, when, and why are we using them. And there will be the potential for injuries on occasion. And it's unfortunate, but the more we limit that, the more we increase the potential to have to go back to limited options, which have higher injury potential than what we have today. This is a test of the long-range acoustic device LRAD-1.